these kind of decisions you have to make in concert and in conversation with your spouse and in just supplication before the Lord. Do you want a wealthy retirement without worrying about money? Welcome to Retire in Texas, where you will discover how to enjoy your faith, your family, and your freedom in the state of Texas. And now, here's your host, financial advisor, author, and all-around good Texan, Daryl Lyons. Hey, this is Daryl Lyons. You're listening to Retire in Texas. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you tuning in. I always have to give you the legal disclosure. Always. (laughs) Always. <laughs> I'm laughing here because we're with an attorney and he's our guest today. So I, you get to hear from Dana Jacobson. But here, let me share with you our uh, legal disclosure. This information is general in nature. It's not intended to provide specific tax investment or legal advice. Visit PaxFinancialGroup.com for more information. And uh, thank you again to Pax Financial Group for sponsoring this program. I want to encourage you to speak with one of our financial advisors. It doesn't cost you anything. It's complimentary and they have a heart of a teacher. You just have to text the number 74868, that's 74868, and put in the word Texas. Really simple and um, really non-threatening dialogue. So again, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started with Dana Jacobson. Dana, thanks for being here today. You bet. Happy to do it. So Dana and I have known each other a while now, but what's cool is I don't know a lot about your background, so I'm going to actually discover Dana a little bit more here. But Dana is an attorney. And he's been a judge and he's been active duty, but there's a lot of facets to Dana that's really cool music. I know that. <laughs> and so we'll get into that today. But first of all, you do you live in San Antonio or is it Fair Oaks? Or I'm in San Antonio. Okay. Yeah. I always associate with you with Fair Oaks, but we'll get to that. You bet. How'd you get to San Antonio? I'm an Air Force brat. So uh, mom was born and raised in Brady, Texas. Dad okay. was born and raised in Austin. And uh, they went into the Air Force, and we didn't really come to Texas uh, for about 24 and a half years. So my, when my dad retired, uh, he retired from a position in uh, the military group in uh, Venezuela. Oh. So that's where I graduated from high school. And so we moved back here in 1975 because they said San Antonio was close enough and far enough away from all of their family. Venezuela. <laughs> so Venezuela, yep. You weren't born there, were you? I was not. Okay. I spent my last uh, three years of high school there. Was he Air Force? Dad was Air Force. He was okay. uh, started out as a, a, uh, an Air Force private, which, uh, you know, so it was a while ago. It's yeah. not an Airman basic. Back then you were a private. And yeah. so he made Buck Sergeant, which is E4, yeah. you know, first uh, non-commissioned officer grade. From there was accepted into the aviation cadet program. And uh, so he got uh, radio operator wings. He then got navigator wings. He then got pilot wings. Mm. So he was one of very few people, uh, Air Force members, who were entitled to wear three sets of Air Force wings. I'm not proud of her or anything. That's (laughs) pretty cool. It is pretty neat. Pretty neat. And when did he pass away? He passed away in October. Well, we're coming up on five years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. I and remember he was, that. Actually. Yep, he was my law partner for 21 years. I remember so, that. Yeah. Yep. He was a good, good man. Very well respected. And you came to the funeral. We appreciate that. Yes. I do remember that. So obviously in a military family, did your mother work? Mom was, uh, they first got married. Uh, when you're in pilot training, you bounce around to a bunch of different little training bases, right? So mom uh, was doing things like advertising at a local radio station, okay. and those kinds of things. Uh, she mainly was uh, having my sister and myself. We're about 15 months apart. Okay. And then uh, she was uh, an Air Force wife. And while she was doing that, she and dad got married. She was a, a sophomore at Trinity University here. Okay. So yeah. they, like many people's parents, got engaged at Earl Abel's. Yeah. You know, at Earl Abel's. You bet. You bet. No, it's kidding. a long tradition. And she uh, then had uh, me and uh, Kathy, my sister, and during the time that she was an Air Force wife, she was also continued her uh, education. So she ended up getting a a degree from Utica College in New York Hmm. and then a uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona and got her master's at the U of A as well. And then got her PhD at University of Texas. And that was about probably a 30, 35 year journey for her. Wow. That's fascinating. And where I was going with that, as I said, obviously was middle class. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, 30 years studying doesn't necessarily, you know, income doesn't materialize just all of a sudden from- Correct. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, y'all grew up in a, and I'm putting words in your mouth, but correct me if I'm wrong, in middle class, kind of prudent, 
conservative. Values were conservative, I think. Yes, values were always conservative. We were a middle class family, uh, but due to the nature of what dad did in the Air Force, he was a fighter pilot, but he was also a in military intelligence. He was a uh, an attaché, a military attaché, which means that we spent a lot of time in the sort of State Department kind of yeah. area, where we were a middle class family with a whole bunch of rich people. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yes, which was always interesting. Yeah, so yeah. the officers' club that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, O club was okay because everybody is, you know, just in uniform, an officer, and, right? Yeah. But when we were in Pakistan, my dad was the assistant attaché for the embassy in Pakistan for two years, and the embassy pilot. You know, you're always dealing with all these um, very yeah, foreign people. service people and, yeah. and that sort of thing, and lots of fancy, you know, parties and that sort of thing, where it was pretty clear, you know, who the folks uh, with money were and mm. who the folks who were there because they had to be. <laughs> yeah, you could tell. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. And the same thing uh, when we were in high school, my mom was actually the head guidance counselor at my high school, which means I never got away with anything. Oh. But uh, it was about 50% American, 30% high class Venezuelan and 20% yep. everything else except uh, the Chinese because they wouldn't send their kids to our school. So, you know, once again, we were middle class kids yeah. uh, dealing with, you know, children of the ultra rich. So it was always an interesting, that uh, is interesting balance and tension. That is interesting. That can create some different dynamics. You know, I can relate to the degree that I grew up in Bernie <laughs> and uh, we didn't have much money, but there are some rich kids in Bernie. So Amen. I kind of see a little bit of that. You bet. And so then you graduated high school and then I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but went to undergrad where? UT, Austin. UT. And then where, law, where'd you go to law school at? Uh, here at St. Mary's. Okay, yeah. So I spent three and a half years in radio, in Texas radio, after I graduated from high school, which was a radio, television, film degree, okay. and then went to law school after that. Okay. And so you go to law school and when you graduate law school, let's let the audience kind of understand how that works. Do you mm -hmm. just hang up a shingle and people come to you or how does... Uh, you certainly can. My dad did that. My dad uh, finished his undergraduate degree after he uh, retired from the Air Force and then went to law school and literally, you know, hung out a, a shingle at the house. That's how he started to practice law. I, on the other hand, was looking for something a little bit more public service-y, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I tried four times to get into the Air Force. And the fourth time is it actually worked. Um, that's a whole other miracle God story, but we won't go into that right now. But bottom line was that the Air Force JAG accepted me pending my passing the bar. So then I took the bar exam. Two weeks later, got married. Eight weeks after that, the bar results came back and I had uh, passed the bar and uh, went into the Air Force. Tell people what JAG is. JAG is the Judge Advocate General's Corps. When I joined, it was the Judge Advocate General's Department. It switched to a corps about halfway through my career. And so those are military attorneys who do everything from prosecuting people and defending people in courts martial or ad adverse administration, administrative actions to representing the Air Force in federal litigation. Mm -hmm. um, I was, my last job on active duty was as the medical law consultant. That's the hospital attorney at Wilford Hall Medical Center. Okay. So a broad variety of things that you can do as an Air Force JAG. How long were you JAG? I was active duty for six years and I was a reservist for 24. The 24 year reservist. Mm -hmm. So active duty then reservist. Mm -hmm. Did you get deployed while you were reservist? I got deployed in place. That means that uh, the Understood. deployment opportunity okay. when it came, or the deployment opportunity when it came up, I was at Air Intelligence Agency. So okay. it was a very sort of uh, intel heavy uh, in uh, surveillance, reconnaissance, that kind of thing. And I basically backfilled the, uh, the active duty uh, staff judge advocate there as a colonel. That makes sense. And then while you're fulfilling your reserve obligations for mm -hmm. 24 years, yes, sir. Yes, sir. thank you for that. And thank you for the active duty. But it's a little bit of a challenge because you have this obligation to fulfill and an opportunity as well, but you still need to work. So where did you work at during that time? When I first got out of the Air Force, uh, because I had been an MLC, a medical law consultant, I actually uh, was hired by a, uh, an insurance defense firm here in San Antonio that did medical malpractice defense. Okay. So I represented at hospitals, hospitals and medical professionals who had been sued for malpractice. Okay. Uh, that's how I started out. And then, uh, just really 
was not excited about the big law firm, you know, yeah. issues it's that, hard, yeah. that they, well, it is. And there's, unlike the military where there was an incredible esprit de port or decor and camaraderie, large law firms pit their associates against each other. Okay. And I was yeah. just, I was never comfortable with that. I went from there to a smaller insurance defense firm for about a year. And then uh, my dad asked if I would join him at his firm. And uh, that just seemed like a really good idea to me. Now, you were a judge for a little while. <laughs> yes, I still am an associate judge. I was the judge, uh, the municipal court judge in Fair Oaks for 15 years. And I uh, have been the associate judge in Cibolo for probably 10 now. I'm also the prosecutor out in Bernie. So if you're listening from Bernie, please don't speed. Um, <laughs> but I've been doing that as the primary, the alternate, and then the primary again for a little over 20 years. So you mentioned Fair Oaks, Cibolo, mm -hmm. and Bernie. And for those that are listening out of the state or even out of the country for that matter, those are just smaller communities right outside of San Antonio. But, you know, San Antonio has grown so much that they've kind of been absorbed and they do have their own municipality and their mm -hmm. own courts and their own rules. I was actually, I live in New Braunfels and I had to sit through a city council meeting. It was five hours and it was rough. <laughs> it's brutal. Yes. It's brutal. But, you know, I think that's just a kind of a, it's kind of cool to think about like, and we'll get into what you're doing today a little bit, but, and since this, this show is Retire in Texas, to a certain degree, we talk about retirement as pivoting, right? That's often, mm -hmm. you hear sure. that at PAX, we pivot to another part of our lives and retire by definition is the disposition of an asset over its useful life. So what you've done is you have, not retired. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's what we, you know, it's kind of crazy that that's the way we've, you know, we use that term, Sure. but you've pivoted several times now. So you've pivoted and you, it's kind of, it hasn't been like just a stark, like you haven't made a sharp turn. Like you pivoted from active duty to reserve. Right. Reserve and civilian practice. Right. It, right. And then you've pivoted from major law firm to dad's practice. Right. It's not like you went to an extreme like, hey, now I'm going to go be a, a coach. And then the pivoting to be a judge. And I just think this is cool how you've done it and everything kind of ties in and you've just kind of let the Lord just kind of lead you different directions. But it's all been rooted in the legal field. Yes. And it continues to be that way. So what does it look like today? Today, my dad, of course, retired in 2015 and passed in 2017. I am the sole shareholder of the Jacobson Law Firm. Uh -huh. It is a professional corporation, and we concentrate in three main areas, and that is estate planning, business law, and probate. I also do, as noted, I do some public sector stuff as the uh, judge and as a prosecutor. And I've also been a city attorney for a couple of small municipalities. Have you, I didn't know that. Yep, yep. Now you've also been a professor, haven't you? I have, yes. I, I, uh, I forgot about that. What, yeah. Is that Hallmark University? Yes, I taught uh, undergrad business law and uh, their master's program business law. Okay, so you're the master pivoter here. So I you've, am. <laughs> you've done active duty, reservist, civilian, judge, municipalities, professor. And hey, now well, let's it, talk about your music. Music. Okay. Songwriter, uh, singer, songwriter, and uh, have done that for, gosh, 20 odd years. I've got a couple of tunes published, which is always kind of fun. Can we find them on iTunes? Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, know they, I know we could. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's been a little while, but I always tell people, you know, it's great fun because I don't have to feed my family with it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been real blessed to have a, a small group that's kind of ad hoc called On the Side, and we uh, will assist people with their, uh, you know, fundraising raising activities and that kind of thing. Uh, one of my daughters sings with me. Both of my sons-in-law play with me. That's cool. Uh, I tell people all the time what I got out of these two marriages with a, with a couple of really good musicians. So <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, and right, my younger, my older daughter is already just a great singer. So uh, we enjoy it. Now, let me provide a point of clarity to our audience. You said what you got out of these two marriages. Mm -hmm. You've only been married once. No, no. Yes. My, my children's marriage. Yeah, okay. Got yes, it. Yeah, I just, have been married yeah. once yeah. Uh, for 37 what? years last month. I thought so. Uh, it, to uh, Betsy. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. And we, uh, she's a trooper. She supports you in all these pivots. She does. She makes her presence and opinions known, yeah. but she, okay, yes, good. she does in fact support me uh, in all these things. It, and as you know, you've, these kind of decisions you have to make in, in concert and in conversation with your spouse and in just supplication before the Lord. She gives you good feedback and says, Hey, this makes sense. This pivot makes sense. This doesn't. And y'all just, y'all work it out. We um, do. Yeah. And, we do. and has there ever been a time where she said, Hey, Dana, that's a good idea, but don't do that. Um, 
a time or two. <laughs> yeah. A time Maybe or two. in that network marketing thing we were talking about before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably yeah, some of yeah. those. Well, yeah. And but we both went through that, but yes, it was, uh, <laughs> there, there are times, I mean, I think that she, uh, I tend to be more spontaneous than she is. You're an optimist. I, yeah, I'm just a natural optimist. Yeah. Uh, she is not. She is, uh, is much more, she would say practical. So Good balance. It, well, it really is. It really is. And we've, like I said, we- Tell the audience how you work that out. I mean, like, can you give us some substance behind that? Because I deal with a lot of people. You do too. Mm-hmm. And marriages are, as we know, you know, you're married for 30, 40 years. And some of the people that are listening have- and this is an unfortunate case, but have developed coping mechanisms through their career that they've never been able to have robust conversations like Mm -hmm. you've had. So how would you advise somebody who's thinking about pivoting? How do they communicate with their spouse on their concerns and what their visions look like? Um, That's a loaded question. It really is. Yes. Uh, But you've done it well. That's why I'm asking you. And I know you have. And what what I would love for people to think is everything always went swimmingly and we, uh, you know, we're in, we're in agreement with everything. And that's simply not the case, but I've not ever taken a a position or a swing or a pivot or change of direction without one, having a full and complete conversation with Betsy and two, without her saying, okay, (laughs) you know, sometimes it's that. And sometimes it's, it's, I think this is a great idea. She is extremely supportive of me. And if I hear her saying, absolutely don't do that. I take that really seriously. Good. Yeah. Good. I believe that to be true. Yeah. A couple more questions as we kind of turn the corner here. It's been fast paced already. So there's just (laughs) so much to your life. That's so cool. So first of all, I just want people to know, as long as I've known you, everyone would say one thing about you, that you're a good man. Well, I really appreciate that. But the question is, I know you've honored and respected your father and you've alluded to the character of him. What would he tell you to do over this next chapter of your life? If he were advising you. You know, his advice to me was often more in the nature of be a good man. Yeah. Whatever you choose to do, commit to it Mm. and, you know, make sure that that God comes first and family comes second Mm. and jobs and careers and that sort of thing come after, significantly after those two things. Oh, that's good to hear. And it's it's what he always said. Now, dad was... uh, We have uh, have talked about my dad as being sometimes wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> he showed that, and uh, but you never had any concern or confusion about where dad stood on any particular issue. Mm. And that's a good thing, it is, you yeah. know, and because at least that way, you know who you're dealing with and, with and what, you know, those responses are going to be. And you can sort of tailor your approach accordingly, which I sometimes did. Dad was uh, old school in terms of believing that a handshake was all that was necessary. Um, It took a little while and a little conversation to get him to agree that, well, we really kind of probably ought to have fee agreements with our clients <laughs> you know? and, uh, and things like retainers and that sort of thing, because dad believed in the inherent good of goodness people. of people. Yeah. yeah. And that they wouldn't commit to do something and then not follow through. You know, I guess at some level that might even be naive, but uh, that's how dad lived his life. And he would tell you, Dana, my son, my Jacobson, mm-hmm. <laughs> be a good man. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think that's worthy of people just settling in on because this is a wonderful picture of values being transitioned down. No question. And uh, what we say about money is an inheritance is what you leave to someone, but a legacy is what you leave in someone. Exactly. What, what I'm seeing today is that legacy. Well, and I'll tell you that, that my dad got it from his dad. Yeah. And that's, as I mentioned to you, we didn't live in Texas growing up. So I barely got to know my grandparents until I was in college and uh, actually ended up writing a song called The Name, which talks about what my great granddad, my granddad and my dad taught me, Mm. which is when you need a good name, nothing else will do. Oh, that's so good. So good. That's scriptural, right? It is. It's very scriptural. All right. (laughs) Thank you so much. But I do have one more question. Yes, sir. What's your favorite salsa? Can we expand salsa to include pico? We can, yeah. Okay, mine. 
<laughs> Yours <laughs> you make some I, good pico. That's huh? I make some real good. You like pico. it chunky? Oh, yeah, chunky and fresh. With hot, and, uh, like fact, is it hot? Like peppers in it? It gets so we. I mainly go with jalapenos and usually go with three rather than the recommended two. But uh, we always have fresh pico in the fridge. Do you have and a garden? We do not. We have talked a lot about doing like a raised bed or something right? like that for just like onions and tomatoes and jalapenos. Exactly. You know, which yeah. would just be great. Maybe the next growing season. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. And that's another thing you can pivot to. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks again for Selling being here. Selling Pico. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Jacobson Pico brand. I think started that's right here. Right. Hey, that's thanks right. again for being here. This has been great. I've I really it. appreciate it, Daryl. Thanks. And thanks for listening to the end, everyone. Um, again, you're listening to Retire in Texas. If you need to visit with a financial advisor, just text the word Texas to 74868. That's Texas 74868. I want to remind you again, you think different when you think long-term. Have a great day. This is the podcastfactory.com.